Alright, so lots of people wondering what will play out tomorrow. So, uh, build up, yes, uh, the figures of those who will vote, security, INEC, all eyes will be on all of them. So, we've got uh, Dr. Jackson Tamonosaki here with us. He is a uh, CDD selection of CDD's election analysis center. Good morning, and thank you for coming on Good today. Morning, and then uh, Samson Itodo joins us virtually. He's the executive director from Yaga. He joins us from Oxford. Uh, so we'll get to see that as well. So, um, okay, so uh, your analysis center has been active, I reckon. So, w what kind of um, stats takes out from your center, notwithstanding the build up to do that? Yeah, the uh, CDD analysis center has been. Uh, Focused on the off cycle elections and uh, with the presidential general elections that was held in February. So, uh, for, for, for the analysis center, uh, some of the factors that played out uh, during the uh, general elections, uh, we see these factors to also. Uh, uh, influence uh, the outcomes of the of cycle elections, if not uh, For instance, uh, one of the key issues that we've been able to identify uh, is uh, the efforts at uh, delegitimizing uh, the electoral institutions. Uh, that is largely coming from the political actors themselves. Uh, we can see uh, in Kogi, uh, in uh, Imo states specifically, uh, where uh, key actors uh, across political uh, lines are already accusing uh, the electoral empire. Uh, yes, and even implicating uh, the security agencies, playing along the lines of the ruling political parties in those states. And so uh, these kinds of uh, narratives uh, may, uh, may likely influence uh, the confidence that electorates uh, may, may have on, on the electoral umpire. Already going by uh, the outcome of the general elections uh, earlier in February, uh, and we observed a uh, reduced uh, turnout of, of voters. So INEC has uh, a lot of uh, task ahead of, 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 of it to uh, re, uh, re reject the uh, confidence that uh, the electorates in these states uh, will need to come out to, uh, to vote on Saturday. All right, uh, so now, for instance now, security, voter participation. Those are some of the key areas. So we've heard the IGP, the NSA, they've all come up and spoken about how these elections will be devoid of any form of interference whatsoever. And usually we see lots of deployment across elections from different states, from different agencies of uh, security agencies. But for this particular one, coming just after the general elections and the pressure people have of this, is that deployment likely going to have any impact whatsoever in terms of whether or not people come out to participate? Or you think that the what, apathy that people feel pervades will still be dominant in these elections across the three states? Yeah, uh, security is a key concern uh, across the three states. Uh, building up to these elections, we recorded incidents of attacks on uh, political actors in Kogi, uh, in, in Imo states. And uh, even the rhetorics of uh, the political actors themselves, you know, about threats to uh, life and, and properties of, of political actors. So, of course, the average Nigerian would be concerned with his or her own safety. Yeah, but you know, the thing about that is, even before that last election, yeah. there, was, there were threats to people's lives and things like that, but they seek him out on mass at that time mm. because they were determined to make a change. Mm. So all of those threats notwithstanding, they came through at the time. Mm. So the threats may exist in some way for these elections, 
Does that then mean that what we'll get the same kind of uh, what atmosphere? People coming out, notwithstanding what's going on. Yeah. So so uh, that 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 also depends on uh, the peculiarities of of each of these uh, states. Uh, for 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 instance, uh, uh, in Bayelsa State, uh, which is largely coastal, uh, you know, we over over the years. Uh, Issues around uh, uh, militants and non-state actors actively uh, influencing the election outcomes. You know, uh, we we, we, we see though? we see that to also uh, play out. You know, you think it will have an impact this time? It happens in almost every election, equally, not just by other states, other states. So uh, these, these narratives are really scary, and irrespective of the deployments that uh, the police has made, uh, we, we learned three uh, deputy inspector generals yeah. posted to each of the states, and uh, three helicopters posted, and, and so much de de deployment. That notwithstanding, the, the character and nature of the political actors you know, it's key to, to, to these uh, narratives. We heard from the uh, military high command uh, just yesterday that uh, there are uh, notifications of, of, of hoodlums wanting to impersonate soldiers. You know, so if, if that is likely to happen, then how can we tell uh, which uh, is uh, authentic uh, military personnel or police personnel or... Or not? When these materials uh, are in the in the open market, anybody can wear a camouflage or a police uniform. You know, so uh, until uh, the security architecture uh, gets to a point where we we have a proactive uh, security uh, in engagements that are non non kinetic rather than this usual uh, re re reactive. Uh, uh, yeah, for, from. What we've seen so far, you, you've talked about the deployment of security, of security for the elections, and there, there are concerns in certain quarters about the need to even um, have so much of security in our election space. At what point do you think we'll be able to come out of that? Yeah, sure, sure. That's, that's a major challenge. That's a major challenge. Even having the military uh, to, uh, to man elections, it's, ordinarily it's, 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 it's absurd, right? Uh, so the police... And the civil defense and other security agencies no, should be elections? able to. Uh, because the law speaks about the perimeter. Who's yeah. supposed to be where? The police yeah. within a certain yeah. radius and distance. Yeah. So if the army is on the streets, is that certain amount of money in elections? Well, in, in as much as they are on the streets, ordinarily are they supposed to be on the streets? We have the police force. We have the Nigerian police force. We have the uh, civil defense and, and other. Uh, parastatals that should ordinarily be able to, but, but this is as, as a result of uh, the capacity constraints, and that's why we have the military coming to uh, elections and uh, be in every sphere of, 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 of our lives. You know, so the, the, the issue for me uh, is the kind of politics that uh, political actors play. You know, they see politics to be a do or die affair. You know, and I don't see how you would want to uh, puts people's life at risk, you know, and you want to kill people, then who, at the end of the day, who, who do you want to govern? You know, so they see politics as a do or die affair, you know, and that's the, the, the drivers of, of this in, in, insecurity. When you say political actors, is it just about those who are in the forefront or also about the people, the electorate? They are also political actors. Uh, by political actors, I mean... Uh, that means everybody, uh, including I, I, you. I mean, by political actors, I, I mean those are the forefront, uh, those contesting for the elections, they are the, and they are, they are, they are, they are party uh, followers who are ready to uh, cause mayhem. And, and this cuts across... Every, every, every party. So well, how do we come out of that space? So coming out of that space uh, is, is, is until, until uh, the political uh, environment and, and the, uh, the lucrativeness of, 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 of political positions uh, is, is, is watered down because it, uh, it's, it seems to be lucrative, right? So 
people spend millions, hundreds of millions of naira on, on elections uh, to be uh, in the government house, you know, and that is because, uh, of course, we know how uh, the, the political class uh, enrich themselves with, with true uh, the, the states. Okay, I think we, we also do have Samson, Samson. Uh, who joins us virtually from Oxford. Good morning, Samson. So, yes, uh, Yaga did release the uh, pre-election data in terms of the, uh, I think you call it pre-election observation report. And you have detailed in several of these key states. But, and then you did highlight that uh, there will be uh, heightened activity for secessionist groups, security, particularly this time. But in consideration of the narratives that has come through from uh, the IGP, it's this time the NSA also saying you know, no interference whatsoever, and the disposition of those men, how, what kind of impact do you think it will make this time? Well, thank you, um, Chamberlain and Nathan. I think that the, the point needs to be made that we expect that the assurances received from the security agencies will make an impact um, in this election. And what's the impact? First, as we have noted in our um, pre-election observation report, that there is heightened, heightened fear and apprehension in the three states due to the spate of violence, uh, pre-election violence. And this has been further, uh, you know, exacerbated with the obnoxious abuse of incumbency powers in those states. And quite frankly, in two states, for instance, in Kogi and, and, and Imut, uh, including Bielsa, these three states, we've also seen, seen a shrinking of the political space and making it difficult, you know, for political parties um, to, to, to campaign. Um, and that, to a large extent, is responsible for this level of apprehension. We've also seen fatalities, and there's not been accountability for the lives that have been lost in the build-up to this election. Whilst I note, and commendably so, that the IG of police and the town hall hosted by channels did make some commitments, and I actually want to go on record you know, to commend the IG for at least accepting responsibility when he apologized um, to Grace Jerry, the PWD um, advocate, uh, when she recounted her experience in the last election. And he gave assurances that this would not reoccur. I think what people want to see moving to tomorrow's elections is that one, in these volatile local governments and areas in Imo, in Baelsa, in Kogi, that the security agencies will deploy and see to secure INEC officials and the materials to those polling, polling units. Secondly, that the voters will be confident that their security will be guaranteed, that they will be protected and shielded from voter intimidation, suppression, and violence. Because as you can see in a place like Imo, where you've seen non-state armed groups, you know, being deployed to unleash mayhem and terror on people. So people are going to be expecting that when they show up to vote in a civil activity like election, which is it should be a festival of democracy, that the state will guarantee and protect them. So that's the assurances that have been received. And I do hope, um, giving the security agencies a benefit of doubt, that they will nip this in board. But quite frankly, is the confidence level high? I, I will be deceiving myself and deceiving Nigerians that yes, the confidence level is high. Their actions have been taken, but the voters in those states and Nigerians deserve more. You also recommended concerning security that uh, security agencies have got to respond to this early warning signs or indicators of violence. And then the one for Imo, you, you narrowed down, you listed some key states that they should watch out or look out for. 
So we imagine that uh, these agencies would have done their due diligence, noticing all these flash points, because they, they're, they're the ones who are, should be on ground, they should have all of this data. When you say talk about early warning signs, um, does that include what? The narratives made by politicians like DSS invited them, those kind of actions. Is that, are those kind of things we should see? And if we haven't seen them, is it too late for any of such actions to occur? I actually don't think it's too late. Um, I think that there are confidence building measures that can be taken. And there are three things that I think that our security agencies can do. One, whilst it may be late to mop up all the light arms and small weapons that are in possession of non-state um, armed groups, I do believe that they can still act within the next 24 hours. Good a thing that campaigns have come to an end. And so they know the hideouts, they know the locations where these people are. And to a very large extent, they also know their sponsors. Can they prevail on their sponsors and arrest them and make it difficult for them to unleash terror um, in, the, in, in the election? The second thing is the need for, you know, non-partisanship and professional management of election security operation. And one thing that needs to be reiterated is that tomorrow's election serves as a litmus test, not just for INEC, but also for the executive and the IG of police, because it's the first election following the contentious and controversial 2023 elections. And what Nigerians and the voters in those states want to see is a non-partisan, a non-aligned, and, you know, a neutral security um, um, institution that will deploy and manage the security efficiently. What people don't want to see is security agencies providing shield for ballot box snatchers for thugs um, who disrupt elections. They also don't want to see security agencies, you know, looking the other way when politicians deploy mercenaries to buy votes at elections. They want to see proactive action on the part of the security agencies. And if you listen to the rhetoric, they've been very, very um, proactive in communicating with the public. However, the actions that we have seen um, it deserves more, more sort of um, um, proactiveness in nipping this in the bud. People want to see arrest. People want to see prosecution of these individuals that have been arrested, um, including those who are publicly known. Again, the actions taken by the IG to redeploy, you know, the well, um, commissioner of police um, in um, Imo state is what um, commending, but there are also other um, 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 officials who have been considered recalcitrant that should um, require that requires action on the part of the security agency. So my sense is yes, the rhetoric great, but you need actions, and people want to see actions, and not just actions that are that are targeted at um, these perpetrators, but actions that are not used as an instrument to clamp down on political opponents of incumbents. Now, Samson, the, the, again, talking about the rhetoric and some of the things, actions and inactions of the electoral umpire and the, the, those that are playing the political space speaks a lot to where we're headed to. I mean, the, the Electoral Act talks about certain offenses that if you're, there are certain things that you do and you would have committed an offense. And we see in the papers before these um, elections, the build up to this weekend's elections, we see where INEC is stalling in the persecution of over 100 people that have been seen to have or allegedly have broken the law in the course of the February um, 2023 general elections. But having said that, look at some of what we're getting in the papers today, deployment of ICPC, for instance, personnel to ensure, say, to prevent vote buying. These are things that we've heard of before. We've heard this kind of deployment. We've heard of deployment of policemen. And indeed, we've heard of the redeployment of certain um, officers of the police force just to prevent certain things from happening. But then we still get there, and these same things tend to happen over and over again. 
at what point do we say, okay, we've had enough and this will end? How do we get to that point? Well, the culture of impunity is quite pervasive and it permeates every aspect of our electoral life. And it's just politicians who believe strongly that there's no consequence for deviant political behavior. And you have institutions that should hold and regulate political conduct fail in their responsibility to do so. And why? Because these institutions have been captured. Because loyalty to the Constitution isn't the guiding philosophy for how we manage state affairs. It's loyalty to an individual, it's loyalty to a political party. And that's a paradigm that we need, you know, to change. Secondly, you can't have democratic elections without consequence, without enforcing the rules. The current electoral act clearly prescribed those rules. But what are the key issues? You need an independent judiciary to prosecute these individuals. Is the Nigerian judiciary independent as of today? Does it have you know, the courage to deliver justice? I think that's a question you know, for public debates. But if you look at what data tells us, is that the confidence in the judiciary is low. And that actually goes down to our management, not just of electoral adjudication or election cases, but also our criminal justice system. And that needs some measure of, of reforms. That people who, who violate the law need to be prosecuted diligently. Secondly, the institution responsible for prosecuting, you know, this behavior like INEC is overburdened. And this is why there is need to create an electoral offenses commission. But creating an electoral offenses commission is not a silver bullet because it still requires prosecution of those people who are considered electoral offenders. So you still need an independent judiciary to prosecute those those people. You know, Samson, if, if I may come <laughs> if I may come in here, that when you talk about the Electoral Offenses Commission, again, the question will be who would who would um, populate that commission? Where would they be coming from? Brings up of this other side of the question I wanted to ask. Where is, mm. We keep talking about is the political players. What about the people? What about the electorate? At what point do we say, okay, you the electorate, it's not just enough that you have a vote to cast, but the the build-up to that election also, you have a role to play in what goes on at the elections and how the politicians carry on with their life. I think, um, Nereta, we need to decouple this, this conversation. Where th there is a role for citizens, and, I, and that's where I was going to land. But state institutions have been created to serve the people, and so they must discharge their mandates because they are state institutions. And if you're unable to discharge your mandate, just pack your bags and leave that institution and let individuals who have the courage, who have the dignity and the respect for the rule of law, man those institutions. And so when you say who are those who will constitute, constitute these commissions, as you know, in the Ninth National Assembly, both the, the Senate did pass you know, the Electoral Offenses Commission bill um, awaiting, you know, concurrence from the House. The House undertook its own process. But there are certain latent gaps in that particular legislation. But now the 10th National Assembly has prioritized the Electoral Offenses Commission. What will, will be composed of this institution? There are proposals that you have retired judges, you have representatives from security agencies, including the ICPC and EFCC. You also have representatives of civil society organizations. Yes, I, I think that um, now that the 10th Assembly is going to commence this process of reform, these are conversations we should have. But at the heart of this, and dealing with the question about, about um, vote buying, is the is the role that governance plays. You know, this weaponization of poverty um, needs to be reversed. On the part of society, I think that voters need to note that yes, you may, your social conditions may be poor, they may be bad, but by selling your vote isn't the best sustainable um, solution 
to solving or improving your social conditions. And that's one message that needs to permeate every aspect of our society. The second is this participation and our attitude towards pol politics and governance. That elections does not, does not start, or democracy does not start and end with elections. That you have a role to play, even post-elections, holding government to account to deliver on the promise of lifting people out of poverty, of providing security. So that engagement across the entire um, electoral cycle is some level of education and political socialization that people do need because, yes, as you have an, an opportunity to vote in Saturday's election, what will be the choices that you'll be making? Are those choices going to be based on your immediate social conditions or you're interested in your future? And this is where people, you know, who have not demonstrated respect for the rule of law, people who do not have a clear blueprint on how to address and improve your social condition or how to secure you, People who are only interested in violent rhetoric, deploying thugs and undermining, you know, the rule of law do not deserve your vote. When you go out to vote tomorrow, look for individuals and parties that you are confident have the capacity to provide accountable, transparent and transformative leadership. Those are the only people that deserve your vote. But if you sell your vote, to these individuals who do nothing but just buy votes, they're going to buy your voices and you will not have the right and even the moral ground. And as lawyers will say, the locals to question them after this election. All right. Just hand it to Ayo. I think I have a couple of questions for you. Ayo. Well, thank you, uh, Nyota. Uh, I'll come back to you. Uh... Mr. Itodo, on some of those comments, talking about our political culture. But let me quickly get to you uh, in our Boja studio, Dr. Tamunosaki Jack. Let's talk about readiness. Uh, we know uh, the INEC chairman put up a statement recently, well, it was yesterday, it's still in the news, of how they said that election is a multi stakeholder. Um, activity and consequently is not something INEC alone can do. So, but INEC definitely has a critical role to play. I want to ask you, first of all, do you think INEC is ready? Um, we have also heard from security agencies um, and they have put out some statements, issued stern warnings, DSS, the military, the DHQ in particular. Do you think security agencies are ready? And then do you also think the voters themselves are ready. Three critical stakeholders in this election. INEC, security agencies, the voters. Do you think they are ready for this election? Dr. Thank you right. very much. Yeah. Uh, so which, with regards to uh, pre preparedness, uh, INEC said they are ready. And uh, of course, we would want to uh, hold them accountable uh, to, to their words. So it's, it's an off-cycle election, so the burden uh, on INEC is, uh, is lesser than uh, compared to uh, the, uh, the general elections uh, when uh, we, we had so many uh, glitches, uh, logistics uh, glitches and uh, late arrival of materials to polling, uh, polling units. And, and also uh, with regards to uh, the functionality of the, uh, the beavers and uh, upload of uh, results to the IRF, uh, especially uh, during the uh, pre presidential uh, election. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we may not be able to uh, categorically uh, pass a judgment on, on INEC yet when they've not uh, written the test. Or the exams. So uh, by tomorrow morning, as the election kicks off, then we uh, we can now look back to uh, the the preparedness level and start making some uh, some some conclusions. Uh, but like like I said earlier, uh, the confidence that uh, the voters have on INEC and uh, the security uh, institution uh, is is low. So it should be an opportunity. Uh, for INEC to uh, regain some level of confidence. 
uh, from from the from the, the, the voters. Then, with regards to uh, the security uh, apparatus and security architecture, uh, with all the deployments, uh, the uh, police and uh, the military have made so far. Uh, we hope that uh, this could mitigate uh, the risk of political uh, violence on, on, on election day. Uh, but my, my worry is the, uh, the proliferation of uh, non-state uh, actors, uh, armed, armed, armed groups uh, in, in these states, especially in, in Imo states and Bayasa states and even in Kogi states, uh, where uh, political actors uh, have uh, uh, armed groups that are loyal to them, you know, and are threatening uh, political political violence. So, in as much as uh, the police and the military are trying to uh, gather information regarding this uh, uh, risk, it's their, act their actual ability to uh, to mitigate uh, this this risk at at the at the polling the polling centers. And this also brings me to uh, the, uh, the recent uh, declaration by the INEC chairman uh, as a means of mitigating uh, violence that uh, polling units that will be violent reading uh, results from, from those polling units uh, will be in, in invalidated. You know? And for, for, for us, uh, we, we think that uh, these may be counterproductive. Uh, reason being that uh, politicians and political actors could, uh, you know, uh, engender uh, selective uh, violence in only units where they know uh, they don't have the strength to win. You know, so if I know I don't have the strength to win in uh, polling unit A, a politician would want to uh, cause uh, rancor and violence just to invalidate uh, the votes of, 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 of his uh, opponents. So this could also be counterproductive and, and, and further, you know, uh, increase the level of uh, volatility in some, some certain uh, quarters. And with regards to the electorates uh, who should be coming out to vote tomorrow, uh, the electorate, I would say, uh, our, our worry is uh, voter apathy. You know, uh, because the general elections uh, in, in February, uh, it's, it's debatable, but uh, most uh, ob observers, uh, we are not satisfied with the, uh, the outcome and the conduct of the elections, like I already mentioned, uh, glitches with uh, technology and, and inability to upload uh, the uh, polling unit results to, to the IREV and all that. So... Uh, the, uh, the, the, this, may, this may likely affect uh, uh, the voter turnout. The last election, uh, voter turnout was about uh, 20, about 25, 26, 27 uh, percent on, on the average. Uh, you know, so uh, we, we, we hope that uh, this backdrop of the February elections uh, uh, do not uh, deter uh, voters from, from coming out uh, with regards to uh, the, uh, the loss of confidence in, in the institutions, uh, that's INEC and, and the security uh, context within which the elections are to be held. Hmm. Well, let me come to you, uh, Mr. Itodo. Uh, some of the comments that you made the other time bothered on what one can say is our political culture. Because I'm looking at study.com now, de uh, defining political culture as a historically based, widely shared systems, feelings, and values about the nature of political systems, which can serve as a link between, system, between citizens and government. So in the light of that, and something that we have often known in our elections, people vote, politicians react, rhetorics follow. Next thing you know, um, people believe what the rhetorics uh, are, that are coming out for their so-called leaders are, whether, and then, of course, they go to the judiciary, whatever comes out of it, there will be comments back and forth. And people tend to believe more of the negative as opposed to the positive. If this is our current political culture, how is that going to change 
if we continue to do the same thing? How will we change what we do uh, in, in, re in relation to this political culture so that Nigeria can win at the end of the day and not just politicians? No, I think the point you made, um, Nigeria, it's, it's important. And when we say Nigeria wins, it means three things. One, that the will of the people expressed through the ballot is respected by political actors and by our institutions. And that there's no attempt whatsoever to subvert the process or substitute people's preferences for individual preoccupations. So I think that's really critical. That's only when we can say Nigeria has won. The second bit is the fact that collectively, our institutions have a responsibility to rise to the occasion. And when institutions, you know, when institutions act in a manner that projects them as serving the interest of a certain segment of our political class and not public interest. Because even the constitution is very clear, and the 1999 constitution is very clear about, you know, the, the overriding public interest that should guide how institutions work. And so when security agencies, election management bodies, you know, who are major stakeholders in this process, do not defend the constitution. Instead, they act in a way that seeks to serve a particular individualistic interest. It hurts the emergence of Nigeria's victory. And in this case, when you say Nigeria wins, so our institutions have a critical role to play. The third bit deals with the role that citizens play and what is our own collective commitment you know to democratic values and this is the point about you know turnout at elections and why are we recording you know low turnout at elections just one moment uh, uh mr Stolo. um we'll, we'll step up on that you know uh right now because that's in my opinion that's the biggest the most critical institution uh in this whole thing that you're talking about but we need to take a quick feedback from uh you know chamberlain in abuja there's a colleague is on standby right now uh to give us some updates chamberlain well yes indeed uh, so we do have uh coverage for bielsa kogi and emo elections but our correspondent in kogi remember lots of build up for tomorrow uh, in Kogi particularly, where some of the candidates to have spoken about the security presence, uh, the apprehension, and what they expect of security. So, Larry Lassisi joins now to just talk to us about how he scanned the area, who are the observers there, what's going on in terms of the environment. Hello, Larry. Uh, good morning, Chamberlain. Yes, we are in Lokoja, Kogi State, on ground for the election, the off-cycle governorship election coming up here tomorrow. Um, I can give you a little brief. Kogi State, we have 21 local governments. We have over 1.9 registered voters. We have 18 registered parties sponsoring um, candidates for the election. And we're really, really looking forward to this election going peacefully and coming out credible. Uh, I can tell you for, for a fact that we've spoken to the uh, resident electoral commissioner and uh, what he told our team is that he's ready. Arrangements have been made um, over a month ago. We had uh, uh, non-sensitive materials deployed to the local governments, to the wards. Um, yesterday, we also had the issue of inspection of um, sensitive materials and um, that was done and that was deployed. deployed. Now, um, to give a little uh, insight, I have um, a guest here with me, uh, Hamza, that uh, is the chief executive of Code Connected Development, to give us a little highlight. Yesterday, you were at the inspection of um, uh, the materials. Can you tell us how that went? 
Well, thank you for having me, Landry. Yesterday by 9 a.m., my team and I arrived in Lokocha. But before that time, a week ago, we've deployed to Imo State, Bayosa, and Kogi State. I first headed to uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria. I was received by the Resident Electoral Commissioner. We inspected jointly security agencies or the INEC Resident Electoral Commissioners. By the way, we have eight Resident Electoral Commissioners and one National Commissioner on ground. We all inspected it. Uh, those sensitive materials, it was sorted and deployed to various rack centers, accompanied by security agencies. So as I speak to you, all the sensitive materials in Kogi State are in various local governments across the state. Okay, do you, you, can you tell us from your own point of view, um, when we talk about security, you know the concern here is the issue of security, voter turnout. What, what's your feeling? What's, what are you feeling? Larry, there's no cause for alarm. Yesterday, I visited four local governments to access in real time by myself. I met with my team on the ground, and as we travel across this local government, we can see very armed personnel on the road, mounting roadblocks and checkpoints. In various INEC facilities, you have enough armed personnel, and this is joined by civil defense, the Nigerian army, the Nigerian police, the Department of State Services. They are very much on ground, and there's no cause for alarm. I even interfaced with different groups, particularly women groups, to getting the vote out and ensuring that they have felt a sense of protection of life and property, and they all commended that they were going to come out in mass and cast their ballot. So for now, there's no cause for alarm because the IGP, the National Security Advisor, have put actions to the words they made to the Nigerian people. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, there we have it, a perspective from the civil society. But this also tallies with what we're feeling on ground. Atmosphere is calm. Basically, a lot of people are just waiting for tomorrow, expecting that the uh, Independent National Electoral Commission will put in, has put in place everything that needs to be done to ensure that the elections start on time and the operation moves and the process moves seamlessly. Chamberlain. Well, thank you very much indeed, Larry. So, Dr. Jack, you, you heard it there. So, I'm just wondering if your analysis center factored in some of these perspectives here, because if he said or they see that the IGP and the NSA appear to have put action to the words that they've been talking about, that so appears to be calm at the moment, uh, one would expect that this should not be the calm before the storm. If it's calm today, Tomorrow, naturally, or well, hopefully, should be the same. Did you perceive that kind of scenario in your analysis? Uh, yeah, sure. Like, like I, I mentioned earlier, uh, it, the off-cycle election, uh, so the, uh, the pressure and, and, and the scope of, of uh, the activities uh, is, is lesser, you know, compared to the general elections where election is holding across, across the country. So we actually expected uh, uh, these kind of, of, of interventions uh, to, to, to come from uh, the uh, security uh, operatives. Uh, but the question still uh, remains uh, on election day. Uh, we can't tell if this tempo is going to be maintained or uh, it's going to es escalate. But with the, uh, the nature of uh, the key political uh, actors across uh, these uh, states. Uh, uh, and like uh, Sam Sinitudo mentioned, uh, the, the political culture, which, uh, which is uh, violence, you know, so, so to speak, uh, may still likely play out. So uh, we would want to uh, call on the security agencies uh, not to lose down the guard, but also to uh, further intensify uh, the activities, uh, you know, to mitigate uh, this this risk uh, election day tomorrow. I, I don't know. In again, in your analysis of this build up to these elections and other elections, one would wonder why we need first of all there's usually one resident electoral commissioner in the state, but for Hogi, for instance, there are eight resident electoral commissioners there. Why do we need eight resident electoral commissioners? So, like like, like I earlier mentioned, uh, the fallout of the general elections. Uh, you know, INEC has lost some, some sort of confidence from, from, from the people, you know. So it's, it's about uh, credibility 
concern. So INEC would want to ordinarily uh, put in place measures, you know, to ensure that uh, the elections are transparent and, and credible. So uh, it could be a scorecard for uh, for, for, for them to redeem uh, their, 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 their image, you know. Let me, let's see if Samson could weigh in on this. Samson, eight resident electoral <laughs> commissioners in one state alone. And, I mean, Dr. Jack has said maybe Annex trying to regain trust from the people. Is that a guarantee? It's not a guarantee, but uh, it's not the first time INEC is deploying resident electoral commissioners to off-cycle elections. In fact, it's part of practice um, to deploy resident electoral commissioners um, to um, the state. Um, but in this particular instance, yes, it's just in the number and the skill. Uh, and the goal is, yes, it facilitates peer learning, but more importantly, it's also an oversight mechanism but also a sort of support to the resident um, electoral commissioners in the three states. Um, my sense is, and perhaps our sense is, if you have two national commissioners, you have nine other resident electoral commissioners, it strengthens the oversight. Um, and in this case, where there are challenges, and, and this, this is where INEC needs to pay close attention. The first relates to issues around resolving issues that emanate from logistics um, um, preparations or logistics deployments. That where there are challenges, you know, across the different senatorial districts and local governments, because each resident electoral commissioner has supervisory um, role to cover a certain number of, of local governments, that they are able to resolve, you know, those logistical issues because as resident electoral commissioner, even though they are not responsible for the state, but INEC has delegated powers to them. So they can exert some level of authority, but also given that they are coming from other states, it is I'll presume that they will be unaligned, they will be detached, and they will be impartial in the management of the election in that particular, in that particular state. The second, it's about supervising the coalition, local government coalition officers for those states. Because we know that the weakest link in our election results management value chain is the coalition, both at word, it used to be word, but now even local government, even in the states. And so these resident electoral commissioners will need to keep an eye on the coalition officers, hoping that INEC mobilized, trained, and deployed individuals with impeccable integrity, and they are also impartial. And thirdly, um, why I think that this is equally important is in the aspect of public engagement, communicating with the public about the challenges, about the gaps, about actions that INEC is taking to respond to those challenges. Yes, Tomorrow's polls, there will be challenges. There's never been any election without any form of challenges. But it's also about how INEC promptly responds to the challenges, but also communicates to the members of the public. And with this retinue of resident electoral commissioners and national commissioners, we expect that the operational shortcomings in the presidential and governorship elections will be a thing of the past. I'm hoping that that will be the reality tomorrow when voters go out, you know, to cast um, their their vote. But more importantly, um, INEC, our security agencies, and the president um, will will be undergoing three tests tomorrow. The first test is a test of the commitment to restoring public confidence in the electoral process. And these institutions have a fundamental role to play in restoring public confidence in, you know, the, the, the um, in citizens' confidence in the electoral process. The, the, the second test is the integrity test, that whether the, in the management of this election um, tomorrow, that the, the integrity quotient of our elections will be enhanced. And it's about not just deployment, management of results or uploading results or the functionality of the beavers. And I think the third um, major test that um, these institutions will embark upon is a commitment to democracy and our electoral democracy.
and how, you know, the respect for the will of the people um, and the, the acknowledgement that voters are the kingmakers when it comes to elections and respecting that will and not making or engaging in any act that seeks to undermine public choice um, will be a major test. And I hope that they pass this test tomorrow and the days ahead. You know, isn't that in itself an admission that, or rather, a suggestion that even the political class do not trust the system? Isn't it a, 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 a proof of sorts that they themselves, if they, if they have to do anything extra to win at all costs, to intervene, to help themselves in the electoral process, isn't that an admission on their own part as well that they do not trust the system to give them justice, but that if whether they win or they lose, those who win celebrate, those who lose go to court or almost all the time, especially for gubernatorial and presidential elections. Isn't that an admission that on their own part, the political class, don't trust the system? I don't think, I don't think that's the case. I think fundamentally, it's about the attitude of the politicians towards politics. And my colleague in the studio makes a very salient point. Now, what is, what is the mindset of a Nigerian politician? Most politicians think that they can subvert any system to do what? To secure political power at all costs. Is that do or die nature of our politics? So you see, legislations are being improved on an annual basis, on a yearly basis. We're reviewing our electoral laws. Why? Because we want to regulate political conduct. We want to regulate you know, the conduct of elections so it confers integrity. The, the systems are there, but they believe that they can subvert the system at all costs. That's why they make attempts at every point in time, you know, to undermine the process. It's not really a lack of faith in the system. But when laws are being made, when INEC introduces reforms to um, enhance the credibility of the process, our politicians, some of them, are devising ways to undermine and subvert the process. It goes and back I to what I said. This, and I often say this, yeah. let me conclude, yeah. that if, if our politicians will deploy their creativity, their, their innovation and genuity in the way they, they prepare to undermine elections, if they deploy that same intellect and innovation in public governance, trust me, Nigeria would not be where it is today. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the same issue, Mr. Itodo. If they trusted the system that win or lose, they benefit. Win or lose, Nigeria wins. If they deployed that trust in the system that no matter what happens, they believe that Nigeria wins, then it is you know, better for all of us. But there was something we were talking about before we went to uh, Kogi the other time about the most critical institution, the office of the citizen. How prestigious is this office these days? Particularly when you look at the way the institutions, uh, the instruments of state are deployed for or against in most cases. On the one hand, the politicians are saying they want to serve the people, but a good number of people will say, well, the people they want to serve are first of all the ones they see in the mirror. How prestigious is the office of the citizen? How has it been whittled down? And how do we strengthen the office of the citizen, which also doubles as the office of the electorate? Well, the, void, the words on the street is that Nigerians are in a very abusive relationship with the state, with their country. And the reason is not far-fetched, that the rights of citizens are not respected, that when public officers are making decisions. They do not consult with the people. They do not deliver on their campaign promises. That justice is not for all. Justice is for those who can afford it. And so the average Nigerian who does not have, you know, access to state power or access you know, to any individual who is a repository of state power or, or because they belong to the lower economic class, they do not have a right. And so that abusive relationship accounts for this level of distrust. 
But government also needs to note that governments across the world <laughs> cannot succeed without public trust. And you have to build trust on the part of citizens. And how do you build trust? One is openness and transparency. How many institutions, how many public leaders are transparent with their people? How many of them consult with their people? And consultation is not going to speak, it's not holding town halls. It's, it's not about that, it's more than that. It's what are your decisions, a reflection of the preferences of the people? But to, other, to the voters, do we also hold our leaders to account? Yes, it is challenging to access our leaders sometimes. It's because we, we give them some, or we cut them some slack often. The, the, you have a right to put your leaders under pressure to deliver to you because they are your employees. If you don't vote for them, and that's in cases where votes count, if you don't vote for them, you would have terrible leaders emerge. And so now that people are going into elections and post-elections, they are making campaign promises. What happens after elections? Are you going to ask them questions about how they've delivered on one, the economy, on budget, on education? Do you even have access you know, to the Constitution, to the Electoral Act? Because it begins with political education. And I think every Nigerian you know, should have a copy of the Constitution because it's an embodiment of your rights, your duties, and also deepens your understanding about how government powers are distributed between different arms and institutions of government. But also that in that institution, in that Constitution, there's also opportunities for you to recall and punish public leaders that you've elected who are not serving your interest, whether through recalls. And some would say, have we had any successful um, um, recalls within um, in, in our um, a, a democratic life? The answer is not far-fetched. But I really think that we, at least we got to a point where in one of the states, there was an attempt to recall a legislator. And we need to educate citizens to the point that when they vote at elections, and they vote for leaders and they don't perform, you can do what? You can hold them to account, initiate a process of recall. If it's an executive position and the executive isn't performing, use the instrument of legislation, of the legislature to hold them to account. But also note that you also have representatives at the local government level who you should hold to account, that there is a contract between you as a voter and the person who you have elected. You've given them powers to de make decisions. They hold that power in trust for you. So they are accountable to you. They are accountable to you because they, are, they can't be in that position if you don't get if you don't vote them. That's why participating in election is critical. Politics determines your life. It determines everything. And we can't afford to stay away from polling units because we think our votes will not count. Votes are counting in Nigeria's elections compared to where we were 10 or 15 years ago. And we make it difficult for people to read when we show up in large numbers to vote at elections. All right, so just one more thing before we go, Dr. Jack. We, I mean, several people have talked about INEC, security agencies, politicians, and they think all these groups have failed them at one point in time or the other. We have amended the laws, we've time and again done several things, and we're still grappling with a number of challenges. So some have suggested, perhaps, if we address this winner-takes-all approach to our election, the zero-sumness, do you think it will reduce all of this I had attitude and everything going this way? Yeah, so uh, of course, uh, politics, uh, it, it's a zero sum game everywhere. You know, you know, it takes all. Uh, the kinds of uh, uh, political uh, environments. Yeah, I mean, that if we, we have we a parliamentary system, system, proportional representation, so that mm -hmm. not, because they say, look, we spend a lot of money. And so if we lose election, we lose everything. Mm -hmm. So if there's proportional representation, they really lose anything, they'll have something to, so it might not be as violent, maybe, who knows. So I, I, I'll look at it from, from, from this perspective. I, I don't think if it's about uh, the, uh, the style of uh, government we run, if it's parliamentary or if it's presidential, 
It's about uh, the, uh, the, the, the political culture that we operate in, 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 in the country. So uh, in, as, in as much as uh, uh, politics is seen as a means or an instrument uh, to uh, get into uh, government and, and distribute state resources, so be it parliamentary government, presidential system of governments, at the end of the day, politics about allocation of, uh, of state resources. All right. These individuals will still allocate these, these resources. So tomorrow, the political culture will be put to test again in the country in three states, Bayelsa, Kogi, and Imo. So how will they stand? We will all see all of that. Dr. Jackson, Tamonosaki Jack, CDD Election Analysis Center, and also Samson Intodo, Executive Director, Yaga. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today on the program. Thank you. All right, we will be back in a moment. Don't go away.